Hello and welcome back to Adventuring Academy. My name is Brendan Lee Mulligan. Oh my gosh, we are so excited today to have our special guest, Ivan Van Norman! Oh, I'm so excited! I got the excitement coming into me right now! Whoa! <laughs> Dude, thank you for inviting me, man. Of course, guys, yeah. you will know Ivan. You've seen Ivan on Geek and Sundry. You've seen him on Critical Role. He is the RPG publisher of Kids on Bikes, Outbreak Undead, and an upcoming Altered Carbon RPG. Mm. Cyberpunk! Very cool. Yeah. Ivan, Thanks for being here, hey, man. Thanks, man. I'm happy to be in this academy adventuring with you. <gasps> Wonderful. <Yeah. laughs> um, of the many lessons of adventuring we have to impart, so I, I, I want to say, so I first came into awareness of your work through shared um, uh, people, RPG people being Yeah, like, which we all saw today, which was lovely and amazing. <laughs> like, I, I was telling Ryan Green earlier today, who is helping out great things over here, but I was... Um, I we, like seeing everyone who was coming out to hang out with you today. It was like old times. It was so lovely seeing all of all of my friends. Yes, we recorded this the same day we did the Bloodkeep episode. So yeah. we had Amy and Erica were hanging out with Ivan. It was awesome. If he was there, a very cool group of people. Um, uh, and it's very it's it's extremely lovely to. We also uh, hung out the other day at Erica Ishii's Twitch. Twitch birthday, birthday marathon. Blue ba boo doing I, things. I watched you conduct what I can only describe as a shamanic fire journey. <laughs> for, it was the most ah. wild. I mean, like, I've been to some wild birthday parties. <laughs> that was a wild That one, one was on fire, you could say. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So uh, uh, I came into an awareness of your work because... Um, uh, first of all, being a fan of Geek and Sundry in general, I had yeah. seen your work before, yeah. but also because uh, uh, when I was talking to some friends through Blood Keep stuff, because I come from a much more uh, LARPy, high fantasy background, right, right. very classic sword, swords, yes. magic kind of thing. Sword and sorcery, LARP fun times. Yes. Yes. And people, uh, uh, and as much as I was into horror games, I just never had anyone that would run them. Right. And people were like, right. you've got to check out Ivan Van Norman. You've got to see what this guy's doing with I, horror. I do like spooky stuff. <laughs> yeah, which is so funny because we, we talked, I think remember we talked a little bit about how similar comedy and um, horror are yes. as far as a formula goes, yeah. how they have similar ways of planting and then paying off and keeping things where you know you'll go you'll ramp up really high and then you'll give it a break and then you'll go back in again and just how to how to structure that and it's in storytelling too it's all the time it's like running a something that is both funny and terrifying you just got to switch out what motivates them yeah you know it really it's really <laughs> true and there's a, a similar thing that uh, it, it's so funny because a lot of times we will get people asking for GM advice. Okay. And yeah. uh, I think oftentimes people are looking for things that are more tactical or cerebral. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. They want it. It's, it's about immersion. Yes. Right. So an immersion can come at a huge spectrum, like all the way down from the, I'm just using my words to I've got every prop and mini on the table to try to bring you, bring the world to the table as much as they can. Right. And just like anything, I've, I've also a little bit, I'm in a bit of a mindset of like a tool is only as good as its wielder. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's one of those like a, I'm personally in the mindset, and this is again, this is all speculative as I am just one man with, <laughs> who has played games in the past, but I have found that uh, maps, minis, and props do not make you a better storyteller. They enable you to tell better stories. Yes, I know what you mean. They are things that are taking care of some work for you. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And they and they enhance mm -hmm. and and drive sometimes certain things to home. Mm -hmm. um, but they but but just having them is not a this equals that kind of equation. You know. I want to bring up something to you, because first of all, one thing that I love, and I think actually in your storytelling, it even goes beyond horror. I think you do this whatever tone you're trying to set at the table, in the, in the, the play that I've seen you do. It's something that gets very hippie, and I have a lot of background in theater and performance, and also in LARPing and very hippie LARP, in what we would call holding the space. Oh, I see, yes. And I think there's an element of running a game where two different, let's just take the most basic building block of what being a GM is about, which is setting scenes and narration, right? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, the difference between um, you enter a 
30 by 30 by 60 foot room. Mm -hmm. There are three zombies in there. Right. And going, you touch your hand to the wood of the door. Right. Right. And as you move it, you know that there is movement within. Right. You can hear it. You can hear the scratching of various feet coming across the floor. You can hear the echoes of water dropping as they illuminate off the top of a tall loft ceiling. Like all of these things that make life so much more. It's just rich. So what is that? Like, how do you... Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? <laughs> but I was thinking about it as you were saying it. In a, in a, in a, this is a conversation I've been having with people about... Let's bring it. Let's make it a little topical, everybody. Talking about the most recent Game of Thrones. Yeah. Plotting versus planning. Ooh, get into this. This okay. is awesome. So plotting is when you have things happen and you resolve them later based off of what those actions are. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I love stories that are just let's see what happens and then let's plant those seeds and then let's see how it grows and then let's harvest that wheat later, you know, in such a fun way. Now, the problem is, is that that's really hard to resolve sometimes because you're just, you're just like, okay, you know, when do I stop harvesting? You know, yeah. um, when do, when does this end? When does my work shift end and I stop have to harvesting wheat anymore? That's kind of to use that terrible analogy and push it forward mm -hmm. while plotting I'm sorry, while planning is much more about this is the narrative structure that I want to abide by. These are the points that need to hit. And the, and the bonus of that is that it helps you stick the landing, which I feel like was very similar with how the most recent Games of Thrones was. It's mm -hmm. like we had for four or five seasons, we had, a, we had writing that was based off of plotting, super heavy on character development. People were just doing things because that's what their characters would do. Yeah. And then they would reap those repercussions down the line. And then at some point, it because an end had to come, Yes, it went and transitioned over to a planning, and now they had to stick the landing. That is so well put, first of all. And then there's also something to that that I think is really funny. First of all, I enjoy it because as someone who loves fairy tales, mm -hmm. the degree to which George R. R. Martin hates fairy tales, <laughs> it made me very happy for to watch his many books and then by by uh, relation, that many seasons of the show, be like, oh, you believe in fairy tales? You believe in fucking, <laughs> you believe in this? You fucking stupid, you fucking child. And then they go like, okay, now to wrap things up. And you're like, yeah, it's gonna be kind of hard now because you fucking hate Hated fairy tales so yeah. much, like that's what you get. Like it's it's risk reward or it it's risk reward, and it's and it, and the and the the only the only thing in my mind that the show suffered from, good or bad, is is that it had to transition yep. at one point from one to the other. If it had been solely plot or solely planned, we would have had a show that is consistent in one form or another. Yes. Either way, but the fact that it's that at some point it made a magical dissolve effect um it we now don't know we, we didn't start with the same show that we ended with so here's a very convoluted metaphor i'll throw your way yes um i like them <laughs> give me convoluted uh so here's kind of what i feel like the relationship between players and a gm can be because i think it, there's obviously room for both but i tend to fall on the plotting side of things okay. of like of like no no for for me to fully honor mm -hmm. my pc's ability to change the world absolutely I have got to understand that I don't get to always have my story happen the way I thought it would. You can't have your story and eat it too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so in other words, it's like you have to say, hey, you know, any any plan I come up with right. has to be put in the binnable. Yeah. It has to be able to be binnable. put in the binnable. Yeah, I like that. And it's, it's uh, I think of it uh, a lot way of like, I when I was reading a lot of behind the scenes documentaries and stuff about how, um, uh, like Parks and Recreation was shot or how Spinal Tap and all these kind of like scene-driven mockumentaries are done. Mm -hmm. My favorite RPGs are the ones that live on those structures. And this is usually the games I like to try to run. Also, just to keep throwing in more topics, why not? Um, <laughs> it's a huge difference between running a home game and a game for like that's a show. Yes. Like being able to to do something that will that will work within the parameters of production is that you kind of have to mix it a little bit cuz pr production needs to know that certain things will happen, you know, but then you like you said you also need to 100% respect your your what I like to call your player's agency yes. to change things. Of course. You know? So there's this weird thing where Imagine like a giant chessboard, right? And it's and I don't think that PCs and GMs are antagonistic, but for the purpose of this metaphor, let's imagine that the PCs are playing one side of the board. Yeah, the GMs are on the other side. And the GMs yeah. on the other side. The way I think it kind of works is mm -hmm. 
the PCs are seeking an immersive experience. Of course. Where they have vastly fewer pieces than you do, yes. and they have to play as smart as possible. Right. And they don't have to always do the optimized thing, mm. but they always should be doing the in-character thing. Yes. So they're trying to play the logic of their character's heart as cleanly as they can. It sounds so much more fun and complicated when you say it like that, yeah. but it's so true. <laughs> right, you know? so they're trying to do that. On your side, you're not trying to win as the GM. What does winning look like? You're you're the allies and the enemies. You're the weather and the stone. You're all of it. But I think that what you're trying to do is to is your PCs are making moves in terms of what their characters would do. Your job as a GM is to go, I see that move, and I'm going to counter to get this into the shape of a story. Yes, it is a reaction game. Yeah, it's a reaction. I like literally the the, the again to to break this into a non-analogy, playing an RPG is about reacting based off of other people's reactions. A hundred percent. And I think that what's what's crazy is you the way you try to, like how do you attempt to stick the landing without having a forced plan? Right. And I think that the trick is. That's tough. It's really tough. It's super tough. And especially if you want your characters to feel like they're doing organic, beautiful things and having an effect on the world. Right. Then, you know, that's that's one of those things where how do you give them an arc while also responding to their immediate actions every right. single scene? And if you go back to this weird chess metaphor, b grandmaster brilliant chess players have the first like 20 moves of the game memorized and they have yeah. names for all of yep. them. And I think when you're a DM and you're watching moves from your player come in that they're doing on this logistical character-based yeah. level, level, you go like, ah, Sicilian dragon defense. And there's a part of you that <laughs> kind of can go, but, like, but yeah. you go like, okay, you're doing a reckless thing. Now I know how to respond to make this feel like the good reckless story. That's, and that's the best part too, is, is that that's why I always really appreciate GMs that also frequently like to be players because mm -hmm. you got to see it on the other side You know sometimes you can't you can't just say well, you know I like to be the one storyteller the best storytellers are the ones who can also tell a story from the other side Yeah, and that should be I mean there's other analogies and metaphors for that But the the point is is that if you can walk a mile in your player's shoes You will be able to absolutely tell a better story or be able to recognize the Sicilian dragon defense because you have a, tried to apply it Yes, exactly. You I know? played for the first time on Brian Murphy's game, or he and Emily Axford and Cobble Tanner and Jake Hurwitz do this uh, yeah. campaign Nad Pod, and I played in it, and I was shocked by how much I didn't want, like, I wanted to kill every bad guy on the first round. Right. I wanted every roll right. to be a nat 20. Yep. And when I'm a DM, I'm always like, why do you want to succeed all the time? That's boring. And then I'm the PC and I'm like, I want to succeed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Give me win, I need wins. <laughs> um, but it's true, it's it's so, it's, it's amazing uh, how much more guided you are when you have an opportunity to know that uh, rewarding a loss, or even better, failing forward, which is one of my favorite things. It's like, yes, you failed, but you failed at a forward momentum, rather than taking a step expression. back. You know, um, and it's just and horror. But the, but the best part is that horror. I mean, so many of those tropes are already absolutely established. We see them in every single horror movie possible. Yeah. And the good news is 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 that even you, there's a huge difference between watching something horrible happen on screen and being like, uh, you're dumb, you did a dumb thing, and then being the person who made the dumb decision and being like, oh my God, everyone's going to die because of me. What have I done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it, takes, it takes a lot of that like um, armchair critique element out of it. Yeah, you know? it's so. I see people sometimes criticize moves that players make, and I always go like, "When the when the spotlight is on your face, and it's up to you, you will be amazed at how much the flop yeah, sweat just, starts." Just, I'm um, just love that people are doing choices and making cool things happen, and they're telling stories, and just appreciate and understand that that is their journey, and it is not yours, even though you have the honor of being able to view that process. A hundred percent. You know, um, I totally agree. Looking at that idea of of you know what is the space and there's obviously honoring player agency I think is huge honoring player agency and knowing the balance between planning and plotting yes. is huge. Um, so you're getting all the terms. Look at all these fun terms. Fun terms. These are ways to think about your game that can help you advance your uh, up your game up your style. Um, so what I would also say to to me is I think that. Um, in the same way we think about minis, maps, figures, right. props, right. lighting, music, yep. as all these really tangible ways to make a difference, mm -hmm. I think that 
as the GM or storyteller, mm -hmm. you and this is really funny because I'm sort of just talking about acting right now, mm -hmm. but like the tenor of your voice, absolutely, the pacing with which you speak, all of that is hugely relevant. And as someone that that, and I think specifically through the lens of horror, which. People fight zombies all the time, and mm -hmm. it's not horror. Mm -hmm. You can have a level 20 paladin fighting zombies. Mm -hmm. That's not horror. What makes a zombie horror? The, what makes... It's, it's, so, it's, it's amazing because, uh, you know, Outbreak Undead is a zombie survival horror simulation. This was like our core... This was our core game for many years. And we discovered over the years that zombies as an enemy are incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. They are. Yeah. They they are repetitive. They are very. They can only do a certain amount of things. But what makes the best stories about zombies stories is how that is used as a uh, as a hook or a means in which to tell terrible stories about people doing terrible things and coming out in the end. Yeah, you know, because because zombie movies never are interesting because of the zombies or rarely they are in my mind in my opinion but what's always interesting is what the people are doing in order to respond to those threats that are inside of there you know what i mean this is actually what i love more spoilers for the final season of game of thrones i uh on a text th thread with some f dimension 20 friends yeah. called i was like the this is me just upping myself i called it um uh, i called i was like first three episodes night king last three episodes cersei yeah, yeah. and the the Reason for that is I think the same thing, which is the Night King is, I mean, scary, but inherently yeah. boring. He doesn't even as talk. As soon as the conflict is there, as soon as, like, literally they've resolved the peak of the conflict, it was done and over with. Yeah. They could have, they could have, if they wanted to make that and stretch out that survival horror element of it more, they could have shown, like, what a siege would have done when people were trying to leave. Yes. Like, what would happen if people are like, I don't want to be here when the Night King's gone, so I'm taking me and my 5,000 men and I'm sneaking out in the middle of the night. Yeah. And then who's blaming on that and all that kind of stuff that you see. And, you know, like, uh, like the remake of Dawn of the Dead did that in an amazing way. And, yeah. like, a lot of the other games that are in there i i just truly find that that horror as a tone and mentality is most fun when you make it about instead of in dungeons and dragons when you give players wins because they've gone through hard things yeah it's the antithesis of that it's when they're having moments of great success and things are going well yanking that carpet out from underneath them yeah and then seeing how they deal with it you know what's crazy we did uh, horror games at my old LARP camp. Way oh, cool! Awesome. We did we did horror LARPs there, and what's so funny is the makeup for a for like a demon yeah. was the same in our fantasy games as it was in our horror games. And we went, so what makes this horror? And we realized that horror is sometimes not about the monster; it's about the protagonist. It's about the protagonist. Yeah. Also, expectations. Yeah. Huge. I mean, it's, whenever I run horror games, I always start with expectations. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we're going to do this. Is there any hot button topics that you don't want to cover, like the X card factor stuff. Are you familiar with the X card? Yes, we had Eric Ishii mentioned on the podcast before, but let's talk, cover yeah. it again because it's worthwhile. So while. X card is just a, it's a thing that um, is basically a card on the table that you place. And if anyone's ever uncomfortable with the situation, they touch the X card and it, it basically it's fast forward, skip scene, whatever it is, we wrap that up in order to make sure that anyone who could be uncomfortable in that situation is at least being respected that they are uncomfortable with that situation. Um, and for me, I always try to like get that in the session zero stage of things mm -hmm. so that I can curate a perfectly horrific experience for them that they're also within their bounds of comfort and ability. Because the last thing you want is a table of people who are all lined up to play a horror game and three of them are bought in and are ready to be terrified and they're ready to play characters that are ready to be terrified. Yeah. And then one guy's ready for a dungeon crawling um, monster bash fest. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. It just it throws the whole tone and, and tune off. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, you've got to be playing the same game. Got to be playing the same game. Um, and I think that there's an element of looking at horror through the lens of this can even sometimes be the same monsters, but it's about powerlessness. Oh, sure. Like, absolutely. Like, it, it's different to see a zombie when you're like, I work at a gas station. I'm a, I'm a guy versus a I'm 
I am a paladin. I have been trained to yes. fight the undead. Yes. Weirdly, like fear responses when you have a weapon, when you have, I mean, it's, it, it changes everything. That's why gimmies in horror are so important. The difference between having a pistol, mm -hmm. you know, in a horror game is hugely different. Or even, here's a better comparison, like alien versus aliens. Right. All right, alien, one xenomorph, a bunch of space truckers. And it's that m movie is terrifying because there's a bunch of people who, like you say, are relatively defenseless going up against one single terrifying creature. Jump over to Aliens, and James Cameron gives you colonial marines, people with heat who are meant for crisis and responding. Their job is to go out and enforce the peace in the colonies, yes. right? Yes. What do you do? You have to put more aliens because one's not enough. <laughs> right. So you got to put perspective in there. So now that movie becomes more about the overwhelming odds and there's no way we're going to make this out because once we're out of bullets, we're out of bullets. Right, exactly. And that's the fear. Yeah, you, it's so funny it, because- That it, most tense, I'm sorry, that most tense moment, my favorite in that is when the auto turrets and you're just watching those those that counter go down yes yes oh god it's so, yeah the, seeing the number go down and that's the funny thing is i think ways of creating fear in games the, the i have mostly run D and D, and what i found to be the easiest way to scare pcs because you can't mm -hmm. it's so hard in D, D to scare pcs with monsters because the, res, the response to monsters is fight it fight it and if you die then oh okay well you know pop crunch a bunch of diamonds in your jaw and then just get rest you know <laughs> yes. magic solves a lot of problems and it makes horror it, it can take power away from horror. It can take know? a lot of magic, fundamental, having the idea implicit in your universe uh -huh. that like, oh, the impossible happens regularly, yes. takes a lot of fear out of things. Yes. So I would say, weirdly, the best stuff I've done to introduce horror mm -hmm. is introduce things where there is an unsettlingness to them, sure. and it's not clear what the PCs are supposed to do. Yeah, that is, I think you've hit the nail on the head. And one of my favorite, uh, so it's so it's so awful to say it on the camera, but it is absolutely true, is objectifying the innocent. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. just one way to be able to do fantasy in a big way. And it's not supposed to be like, oh, now I'm mad at the villain because they're they're harming innocent. It's like, in in a horror, one of the best things that you can do is not show the monster, and instead show what the monster can do. I mean, that's like Grendel, right? The first yeah. thing you see of Grendel is the dead Danes yeah. in the hall. Like, that's it. You know, and, and that's the whole point is it's it's sometimes it's better when you're dealing with something that's nasty just to show them what it's capable of, whether that's a necromancer who's just risen your recently dead party member back to life and is now stalking them in a way that is horrific and awful, not with the intent to kill, but the intent to maim. Right. You know, or if you have like a terrifying monster that is literally rampaging and has and has no emotions, but also has a cult that is literally trying to bring people into it to show their faith and devotion and are capturing people in the night. Yes, exactly. And I think what that gets at too is if you want to create those story beats, it is about like, there are scenes where your PCs can feel momentarily powerless, which I think right. is integral to horror. Yeah. Like the PCs are fighting a necromancer. If you just show a bunch of vampires and some zombies, they're gonna, they're gonna fight it. They're gonna fight it. Yeah. If you get to that graveyard where they're like, we need to get to the graveyard before the necromancer gets there, yes. and they get there and it's all fresh turned earth and all empty coffins. Yeah. And there's nothing to fight there, yeah. but they know what it means. That it's out there. Yeah, and that's important too. Or what you, it's, I had one of my favorite games um, that we we did, and I didn't GM this, this was my business partner who's now my GM. One of my favorite horror sessions he ran was is he gave us an opportunity to go explore. Um, uh, we were trying to collect information, and uh, obviously the information we needed to find was in the abandoned orphanage that's, you know, mm -hmm. on the hill. And he said a perfect setting of the orphanage. We, ne we didn't fight one monster for like three sessions. All we were doing is waiting for when it was coming, and the insinuation which, by the way, by the time the whole thing was done, we had learned that the orphanage, like some person had basically taken the orphanage and made flesh golems, you know? Oh. Yeah, out of like all of the children in the orphanage. And the payoff for it was is that we had found a set of toys and these flesh golems were way higher than our player level. So there was no way we were ever going to kill them by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. It's the only way to get them out the only way to get out of this encounter was to distract them with toys so that we could run away. 
Yeah, I mean, tr- truly, truly, truly. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's so interesting. Those like, yeah, weird non-combat solutions do bring out that feeling of dread. And especially when you're, and again, you're just using, you're using these, oh, it's just like, like just take, take the things that are worse that your players hate and turn them into things they don't expect. Yeah. Just do it. Ugh. And make sure you get their permission to do it before <laughs> A hundred percent. We're going to move along to audience questions now. Uh, exactly. Uh, so all of our audience submitted questions only get submitted on our Dropout Subscriber exclusive Discord server. Cool. Say that ten times fast. Cool. Uh, uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you could have been watching it weeks earlier on Dropout. If you're watching this on Dropout, holler. <laughs> Uh, this first one uh, this comes to us from Errol A. Koenig. Thanks, Errol. Uh, I'm a couple sessions into a campaign, and I just realized that my PC is gonna have a heel turn and try to kill this other PC in my group. Um, my DM gave me the okay and said he thought it'd be fun. Um, do you have suggestions that will help me do this so it is narratively interesting and doesn't come off as needlessly mean? Also, how should I work with my DM to get the best result? Is this a PC versus PC? Looks like it's PC versus PC. So in that circumstances, I would say the way to guarantee fun in this is not just to talk to your GM about the situation and do the heel turn then. This may be awful for you to hear, but I guarantee you it's the right way to do it. You got to talk to the person who you want to kill. Yeah. Because if you want to narratively make it awesome and make it win, they got to be on board, you know, for it. And they have to be willing to let it play in, in the joint time. And that might just be some, something as simple as, I think my character hates you and they want to take your life. And then based off that interaction or whatever that, that like reaction the players come from, then either proceed accordingly or, and this is the thing to avoid, don't deny their fun on the behalf of your fun. Yes, that's really huge. I think that you, obviously, by asking this question, you are feeling the right feelings of, like, this is a big deal and needs to be handled This is carefully. something I want to do. This is something my character wants to do, which, of course, your immediate response is, like, I got to do what I want to do and I need to do it. But, yeah, it is. there's also people playing the game. Right. You know? Uh, I think Ivan is absolutely correct that you owe it to the other PC at the table to bring this up. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I would say, depending on the, the advancedness of your group, you, you may even want the DM to address it to the group at large, oh, yeah. even for PCs that are not gonna be involved in this inter-PC yeah, conflict. make it a thing, make it a thing, because you could literally make a cool arc out of it. If everybody's on board, let me back up. The good news is that if everybody's on board with this, it's going to be awesome because <laughs> everyone's going to make a moment out of it and it's going to be super cool. And your other player who is going to go through this heel turn and get stabbed in the kidney is you don't even have to tell them when and how and if it's going to happen. They just need to know that the reality of it is possible. That's all. Yeah. You know? A million percent. Um, uh, good luck. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Talk uh, to your friends and communicate. Well, I think this goes to a deeper level too, which is the idea of um, having an understanding of what these games are is not uniform person to person. I know a lot of people start playing these games even as they are grasping the improvisational role play character stuff and still will think of it like a board game. I was like, I play with a lot of new people. I have a lot of friends in comedy that haven't played games before. I'm like, let me, I'll teach you how to play. You can get 10 sessions in and someone will be like, I'm gonna like steal from another PC and a person will be like, you can do that? Like, does that make (laughs) sense? Like we're 10 sessions into telling a story yeah. and people still think of it like a board game. Yeah. So I would people, s- people sometimes live by parameters of rules. Exactly, live by parameters of rules. So I think what will suck is, let's say that you and this other PC have beef, maybe the other character would have gotten the drop on your character, but wasn't doing it because that player assumed that was outside the bounds of normal play. Right. So if you spring it on them, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, well, man, I would have like played this differently if I knew that was acceptable. There's also a point, and you bring up a great point too, there also could be a point in which that person who didn't know that was in the parameters of play and their relationship upon your target mm-hmm. um, might be more offended that 
you took out the targeted player than even the targeted player is because you know it was caught off guard they didn't know like all of these things that could happen without good communication so yeah know. absolutely and again like and, and if you're like, oh, man, well, I bet I really want the surprise. I get that. I understand that. In fact, I understand you and I completely understand wanting to make it a glorious, wonderful surprise. Unfortunately, if that stuff wasn't established really on early in the game in the session zero elements, then it's 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 kind of like cheating on somebody without talking about the fact <laughs> that you are OK with being cheated on in the first place. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> it's like yeah. You don't want to cover that after the fact, and I think you can probably even the person asking this check in with yourself. Yeah, a lot of times that you want to d want to do something, check in with yourself. Is the other person really going to be chill if you murk their character uh, with no warning? Probably the answer is no. And in that case, it's not going to make a lot of difference if you're like, I cleared it with the DM. It's just not going to make that much difference. No, it's it's like asking your mom if you can sneak out of the middle of the night and she kind of was chopping carrots at the time and was just saying, uh-huh, and then your dad found that later. He's <laughs> pissed. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, totally. It's got to be. It really does. Know. That's a great. I love that analogy. It's like because because it's the same. It's the same principle of of like oh, but I have I have clearance to do it. Yeah. And you're like if your clearance was gotten piecemeal or it wasn't fully official, yeah. it's going to be a very weak shield against the social repercussions of what you're. Yeah, and you don't want to sacrifice the group for that. Like yeah. you're, you're all playing together, like having a good time. The point is, I think, and we've we've overstated this enough. Talk to everybody involved and make a glorious moment out of it. Yeah. Re you know. And I think, too, that those surprise betrayals can come, because I think Ivan touched on saying um, Session Zero. There are certain games where oh, yeah. betrayal yeah. is par for the course. Oh, yeah. Like, like if you're playing Risk, no one should be like, you've attacked me. Yes. <laughs> it's yeah. like, or, you know, on the RPG side, playing Paranoia. That's the game. Yeah. The game is literally backstabbing each other. So that's not weird. You know, d and is a little different. Other games are different. If you're playing a horror game, more likely than not. So many ways. So many ways to make it awesome. In fact, I think, uh, I don't know if you've read the new cinematic RPG um, for uh, the cinematic RPG PDF for the new Alien RPG, but they literally mention that, that if a character has a beef with another character and they turn traitor, mm -hmm. if it's a one shot, they literally hand over the character sheet to the GM. And now the GM is now playing that character who's now an NPC and they pull up a new character inside of uh, from whatever pool is available or rolls up a new character. And now they take that over as part of the story. Whoa. Yeah. So it, it doesn't even want to deal with like inter inter. Um, uh, intergroup conflict. It's just like, okay, you got a beef with this person and you want to kill them. All right, well now they're rogue and you pick up a new new hat. Wow, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, so I think obviously that indicates that a lot of this stuff needs to be established and cleared beforehand. Good question. Um, this one's from Drew. Thanks, Drew. Um, how do you? This is ooh. This is a very. Uh, we're in a, we're in a vein here. Okay. How do you balance PCs being? secretive Ooh. do you promote whispers notes and texts or do you ask them to do it publicly i want my players to enjoy being the spy but i don't want my other players to metagame and or distrust the spy thief archetype oh i mean i have two thoughts about this one all depends on your group what they're cool with what they're not cool with and two uh, if you're gonna be the spy you kind of got to buy into the fact that you're going to be the spy. Like, I mean, you can't be upset about, well, let me rephrase that. Sorry. You're going to get what you pay for if you want to be secretive. And it should be something that your GM can integrate into the, into the play. But for me, I've always, even in horror games, it's like, unless the theme is distrust yeah. in the game, it's better to have everybody on the same page. Yes. And if it's a one shot and you and you and again, if I have a one shot and there's a traitor in my one shot, I will tell everyone at the beginning of the session, there's a traitor in your group. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's midway through it, I'll still say there is now a traitor in your group because that's part of the suspense, too. Yes. You know, and but I will not let it be like, is there a traitor? Is there not a traitor? Like, no, there is a traitor in your group. And you got to figure it out. You know, I think that's absolutely spot on. And I think that there is something really to this as well that um, 
there are a lot of ways for secretiveness and things like that to manifest because even in the most classic, like what's the most classic time this comes up? How does the rogue tell the DM they want to pickpocket somebody else in the party? And it comes up all the time. Sometimes it's like a sneaky little note. Sometimes yeah. it's something else like that. And and oftentimes in a normal high fantasy, I don't think I've ever seen a time that a rogue has tried to pickpocket somebody and it not been like, what the hell are you doing, Carl? Yeah. <laughs> like what, what what did you gain by that? Like what did you do? Was that just fun for you? Yeah. Uh, and usually the answer is like, yeah, no, I just wanted to steal something. But yeah. That's that's. I mean, again, it's just it. Depends depends on what the expectations of your group is. If your character has secrets and is secretive and it adds to the plot device, like if your character is a spy and they are carrying secrets for their you know, for their client or their master or whatever it is and they have to harvest those secrets and then pay them out later, totally cool. It's not affecting the players, it's contributing to the story, and it might be a fun way for like your spy character to get it drunk and let something slip one time and now that's a plot arc. Yes. Like there's so many ways to be secretive and be able to play with the plot rather than playing against the players. Yes, I think that's true. I think also there's an element of of tone and genre in all this, which is like if you there are way, like let's say there's not a specific traitor inter, intergroup conflict. Let's say that like for whatever reason, some of the themes or tone of the campaign have characters keeping like painful personal painful secrets. Painful personal secrets, yeah. So personal arcs that are secrets, dope. Awesome. I think your question was specifically talking about a spy or diplomat, though, who's like secrets yeah. or their Do you trade. promote whispers? Well, it says, do you promote whispers, notes, and texts, or do you ask them to do it publicly? So this person sounds like they have a spy in their game, but the overall question could relate to any kind of sure. note keeping, secret keeping. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think too. Uh, so I did a, a game for many years called Storm City that was mm. fantasy noir. It was like a crime riddled awesome. high fantasy. Oh yeah, and noir. <laughs> Different. Di all bets are off in noir. <laughs> You know? <laughs> exactly. So with that one, we, we were playing back in the day and we all had like Nintendo DSs that were like keyed up to each other. And I would have multiple players at any time texting me little things on the DS being like, hey, I'm doing this. I rolled this for my stealth check. I did that. So there was literally like, t th there was the game happening on the table and there was the game happening in the text. <laughs> That's see again. If that's part of the game, dope. Like I had a Vampire the Masquerade, uh, game, which is built for that. Which kind is of. built for that. And I had a character who only commuted through one of the characters. It was, but it wasn't. It was a, it was an NPC aid. So again, it wasn't like. But they were kind of a dark secret to one of the players. Again, so just something was motivating it. But they talked to them solely through AOL Instant Messenger. You know, and yeah. had the wackiest username. And that would come up on a time of time. But again, that was just a secret that motivated the story mm -hmm. and would occasionally talk shit about the other player characters that that player character could then use then to kind of like poke and jab at the other ones. But yeah, we're talking about modern, we're talking vampires. That the whole point was to have a veil of secrecy a little bit and everybody was on board. Really, the point of these last two questions that the only issues and conflicts that come up is, is that if you're the only person on board and the only person who wants this t kind of fun to happen and everybody else is caught off guard, that's the only time when people can have a bad time. A hundred percent. You wanna all be having the same type of fun together. Yeah. Um, and I would say too that there are, but there are a lot of fun in terms of nuts and bolts. Assuming that the table has all agreed to play a sneakier game, yeah. um, I think that there are sort of like overt sneaks that are okay. Handing a piece of paper, asking a player to come out to their room, oh, or yeah. asking all players but one to leave yeah. the table. Yeah. That could be very fun and rewarding. Yeah. Uh, there are also tips and tricks for how do you have the covert sneaks, like sneaks oh, yeah. that people can't, I, I played a nad pod recently, I had a character that was lying to everybody, mm -hmm. and me and Murph worked out this thing where we used a character, my character used passive deception in 5e. Oh, cool, great, great. yeah. Awesome. That's a that's a nice way to like have a unique mechanic address kind of like some deception. Because it's like you know? if you're asking these PCs to roll an insight check yeah. every time I open my mouth, they're gonna know some shit is up. How yeah. do we keep them from doing that? You basically pass it or there's overpass your perception, then you know, now you're you you literally are qualifying the exceptions rather than having to check it every single time. Exactly. You know? Um That's good. That's a good idea. I, I remember during Sagas of Sundry we had a moment in which um, again, secrets that motivate.
motivated the plot. I pulled a character away and said that they saw something very specific that happened to them, and there was a voice that was telling them very specific things to do very specific actions, right? Mm -hmm. It was, and I didn't even specify if it was a divine or evil thing. It was just, this is someone telling you to do this. And then I went and told the rest of the group that they saw nothing, and this person has been talking to someone and they have not been there for the last five minutes. Start up. Yeah, you know? And that was how, and then that's the whole thing. And now we've, I've, you know, we created a moment in which, you know, now one person has been talking to nothing, but they truly believe that this has happened, you know? Oh, man, that's so <laughs> unsettling. <laughs> I love that. Um, uh, cool. And, and continuing right on with our theme today, um, how does a DM reconcile, oh, this is from Spets Nazzy. Thanks, Spets Nazzy. Thanks, Spets Nazzy. Uh, how does a DM reconcile someone who just has to make a chaotic evil character in a quest right. that is trying to accomplish a good ending? Mm. Not only have those been the hardest characters to make playing as a PC myself, but as a DM, it's a nightmare to make sure that they have a reason to be in the party so doing the I've quest. actually ran a three and a half long year campaign of 3.5 in which there's only two players in the game. One was Lawful Good, one was Chaotic Evil. <laughs> yeah. Was just two players in the game. I was literally a pious monk who took a vow of poverty, and one was literally a plague warlock. You know, Jesus. And the only reason that game worked mm -hmm. at all, common enemy. Yeah, that's it. Only way. I'm sorry. Everything else is forced or difficult. Your your chaotic, evil character and your party always have to have a common enemy. Otherwise, it's just going to be about like. It's always going to be a conflict of alignment, yeah. you know, and 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 making sure that you know, because for example, this this plague, this evil character would just burn villages willy nilly as part of it, but they would only ever do it when I wasn't looking, you know. Yeah, it was kind of a situation because we always knew that if one ever caught the other one doing something that they didn't like, that they would just punish the other one for it. Yes, and it becomes a spy versus spy kind of attitude, and so you just have to both understand that the story needs to move forward, and you're all finding a common enemy, and that's okay. I think that's very true, and I think that also what you can, what you are allowed to do, is make a personal assessment about the good faith versus bad faith of the player at the table. Yeah, no, and you're I, doing it. You're doing a, uh, an insight check at the table about the person <laughs> who wants to do this. Yeah, and if a person you is know? like, I want to play a chaotic evil character, and the read everybody else gets is this player is kind of trolling us yeah. as people yeah. trying to have a good time yeah. together. You're allowed to act on that. I know it's, this is like such a this is like a hot take for 2019. Seriously, you're allowed to act on your group intuition about if a person actually has the needs of the table in mind. Especially, and it's so funny because basically our entire episode and all of our questions always comes down to kind of the same bottom line: just communicate, communicate with your group and with your DM. Your if they if you think they're going at it with misintent and they're just trying to poke at your fun and you don't want anyone to poke at your fun, mm -hmm. then don't do it. Yes, 100%. Uh, I, I, you, you have to draw the line. It is okay to have boundaries. Yes. Um, I would say, too, that let's say someone, now let's say this. What in our mind does a good faith effort to oh. play a chaotic evil character oh, look like? Oh, that's a really good point. Uh, do you want to go first or should uh, I'll, so I'll pitch out my yes. thing, which is I actually did this. Uh, my, my brother ran a maritime campaign. Cool. It was all like Age of Tall Sail. Uh, yeah. And um, I played a pirate who was a chaotic evil pirate. Cool. Um, and he, playing someone on the end of the spectrum, there is chaotic evil, the cartoon version, and sure. there's chaotic evil, the realistic grounded version. Right. This was a guy who... You were an operating sociopath. An operating sociopath <laughs> needed a crew, wanted to make money. You got to have food. It, you, you can't actually murder every single person you meet. You actually can't do that. No. Uh, you'll get killed. And his backstory as a pirate was he was a young man of low social class in a very highly stratified society. His only means of uh, mobility was to join the Navy. Mm -hmm. He committed war crimes in the Navy because he was instructed to. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was of low birth, he never achieved higher station. When he got back, he said, I've only been trained how to commit crimes on the high sea. I, but I'm. But I have a twenty intelligence. You had a John Rambo pirate. You had a John Rambo pirate. Yeah. That's I drew first blood. I drew first, I drew first blood. blood. 
so so his whole thing was like every inch of this world is violent and the parts that aren't violent you don't understand i don't understand yeah. and also the parts that aren't violent are benefiting from the parts that are yeah the parts that are comfortable are comfortable because people go out and, and do it's the great violence. Because if some goody two she wants to come along and convert you, it's not like they're going to do it like day one. Like in <laughs> right. fact, if anything, they're just going to get a knife in their back. Um, but what they can do is, over the course of a very glorious character arc, you can both balance each other out. Right. You show them the wrongs of the world and how to make it, and you know, uh, and and show them that the world is not as glorious or or sparkle filled as they once thought. Yes. And then your 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 good character understands that can make the other one understand that not the whole the whole world isn't crap yeah you know? and I think too a lot of times people will I will see a misconception online of people going like like oh any character who has a justification and a cogent ideology can't be evil because evil has to be insane right. yeah. and you go like no my character has reasons in his history and in his personality to hate people Sure. That's evil. Yes. And it, the fact that he's got it all tied up in a bow right. doesn't mean that it's not evil to want to harm most right. people. And he's not just a walking a walking stabby ball. You no. Know? It's just literally it's bringing it's bringing and the only time that that gets interesting is when you start to have those moral choices in which your chaotic evil character has to decide is this wor am I going to go along this because it's uh, even though I don't agree with it, am I going to go along with it because it fits my needs? Like yeah. that kind of a thing. So. Um, and he was very much a part of the party. He moved along. He was with all the people. He's like, well, we all need a ship, don't we? We all need to. You know, like doing yeah. his whole pirate thing. And I remember the first time that his alignment came out, it was in a battle where <laughs> there were these like little like artful dodger street urchin kids yeah. that had betrayed us we'd paid them to guide us to the city to the harbor yeah. they betrayed us to like sell us out to these older thieves so one of these older thieves showed up with one of these little urchins who had like ratted us out taken our money yeah. and then s told on us and there were other urchins around kind of like watching oh, and you just went to town my pirate character there was the big military threat that the, the soldier they had brought my character sidestepped them stabbed the kid and went that's the cost of telling tales and yeah. There you uh, go, and and all Dead the other mental. characters went Whoa, like yeah. balked, and but the thing is that's not the same as like I'm gonna burn down every village I see. Right, it was this story moment where they all saw how twisted he yeah, was. Yeah, and it's you 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 made it unsettling. Yes, you know, which is fair for when you want to do chaotic evil, and and for me like my my example of what a good faith chaotic evil character is, and I think this describes perfectly how you were playing yours. It's that not everything they do in the game has to serve their alignment directly mm -hmm. and they don't have to they don't have to show off their chaotic evilness every opportunity that they can get in fact if anything it should serve the story it should um it should uh it can be unsettling like yeah. you said but it shouldn't stop the flow of the game yes like there's there's a pacing pacing is still super important in games all the time like yeah. if you're just making if you're basically putting wall chaotic evil walls up every single time the party's trying to move that gets a, that gets tiring yeah you know and it's true too like the party's paladin sometimes is just having a sandwich yeah he's not doing lawful good stuff no. every second <laughs> of the day sometimes he's just eating lunch he's just having lunch <laughs> yeah like your chaotic evil guy can like have a meal yeah. You don't have to. That's such a good point. <laughs> it's, so there's more truth in that statement than any. <laughs> it's brilliant. Uh. Oh man. Um, uh, well, yeah. So, so I would say, um, and yeah. So, so what does a good faith effort look like? And like, also, like, what's the point of that? Because, like, yeah, it was very disturbing to play a character who like attacked this like not the, the the kid had like tried to get them killed but it's still a child yeah. it's an incredibly evil act yeah, it's it was incredibly like evil it was act. like disturbing to me to yeah. do it but so the answer is like what is the value in playing a disturbing character right and to me I've played a chaotic evil pirate. I also played this lawful evil giant who was kind of like a like wanted to serve tyrants, oh. literally like a bootlicker. Like yeah. he wanted to be like the strong arm because of a powerful. He knew he was right. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's one of those things. And so. I think that there is a, a value uh, on a personal level of uh, 
playing if you have someone who's like i want to play an evil character it's okay to go why yeah why what do you want to get and and more importantly actually i would say more than why is say you want to play a chaotic evil character okay well how do you think that chaotic evil character is going to serve the story yeah and how do you think it's going to complement your party infrastructure because yeah. if they can't come up with, if they're like, well, I don't want it to complement the party structure at all. In fact, I want it to go against the party structure. Then you're already seeing the red flags that you need to have those conversations about. Right. Because now you know how that character is going to play that. And it's know? okay to give someone a no. It's okay to say, if someone's like, I want to oppose the party. And if you go, no one no. else is into that, yeah. you're allowed to go, hey, respectfully, this might not be the game for that concept. Right. Yeah. So let's th think of another concept, we or maybe this is not the game for you. Yeah. And those are, that is what you just said right there is literally the most, it is the kindest, gentlest way to say that your fun is fun and I understand and respect your fun. But if your fun is not everybody's fun, then, then go find your fun. Yes. You know, and have fun. <laughs> a, a million percent. Go have fun. Yes. However you do right. that. And, uh, and, but I think if people come back, like for me, playing evil characters, uh, especially there's playing comedically evil characters, but then I think playing yeah. actually evil characters, like why go to that weird dark place? Well, because yeah, you did that. That's yeah. the, whole, the whole point of Bloodstone Keep. Yes. It's to all play <laughs> atrociously evil characters because that's that's the game you're playing and that's the joy. Again, yeah. it's just about it's about the, the, the story that you're driving in. You yeah, know? because it's the difference between a fantasy demon and a horror demon. Exactly. And there is that element too of when you're playing it, like in the moments that I've gotten the chance to play evil characters, I abhor evil in day-to-day -day life, but evil is made out of selfish impulses, yes. and when you get to play a character, you go, what would I be if I always listened to the most violent version of myself? This, this is also the way, this is the reason we have horror in our lives, is because it is much easier to observe and be passively a participant in horror than to live horror. You yeah. know, I under no circumstances do I want any of my stories to ever come true ever. Yes. But under every circumstances, I believe that we all become a little more human after every atrocious tale has been told. I love that. <laughs> Guys, this has been Adventuring Academy. This is my guest, Ivan Van Norman. What Thank a you, great Brennan. time. Yay. See you guys next time. Hey, gang, Brennan here. If you dig college humor and want to support what we do, sign up for Dropout. For the cost of a very big dumpling per month, you'll get videos like this a whole week sooner. To chat with us live in the Dropout Discord. And exclusive content such as Dimension 20. There are no stupid questions. Are you my freaking dad? <laughs> <laughs> so sign up for your free trial today. Or don't. You know, do what you think is right. I'm not I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life. I don't, I don't even know you. That would be crazy. I um it was wrong of me to tell you what to do. I'm sorry. And that's on me. I'm ruining the CTA. <laughs>